How we raise and interact with children is an issue that has a direct bearing on our future. And the BBC documentary entitled Animals at Play has covered some interesting observations that may be relevant to how we understand this issue. According to News Hub, the BBC claimed that, in one of the documentary's experiments, a troop of baboons are given some toys to play with. It later adds that the results are striking. Female primates are seen playing with dolls, while the males play with trucks. So, the question could be asked, you know, why does something like this matter? And although a lot could be said in response to that question, I'll offer just a few thoughts. One approach may begin with some observations. They may note that there are certain gender disparities in society, and that these disparities affect children. And one area deals specifically with the toys that children play with. So you know, when you look at the toys that boys play with, when you look at the toys that girls play with, there seems to be some differences on average. They may then go on to claim that the way that we treat children is what produces these disparities. This includes the toys that we offer them, perhaps the toys that we make accessible, the toys that we perhaps encourage or you know ban them from playing with, um, perhaps even the way that we model playing for, for kids, whether it be us showing them how to play, perhaps it be, you know, what they see in movies or in, in commercials or even in, in the in the toy stores when they walk in and they see a, a boy's section and a girl's section. All these things can sort of influence how children ultimately end up playing with, with the toys that they choose to play with. They may then sort of critique this way of, of society interacting with children or, or perhaps critique this this way of raising children, and they may argue that these social forces which influence the way that children play with toys are somewhat limiting, perhaps somewhat restricting, and they may interfere with the child's development. They may prevent kids from reaching their potential, and perhaps to some extent they may, I guess you could say, impose gender stereotypes on the kids, which may end up being suboptimal and perhaps even harmful in some ways. This may not only negatively impact the kids in the short term, but also in the long term, uh, given this idea that, you know, sort of childhood is sort of foundational for what the child will eventually become as they grow older. The solution to this, then, is to sort of implement a gender-neutral approach towards raising kids and towards interacting with children. This will sort of remove any idea that boys ought to act one way and girls ought to act another way, it will remove the idea that there are certain boy toys or girl toys. Rather, we just have kids who are just playing with toys, again, generally speaking. And what this approach is sort of built upon is this idea of perhaps, you know, bodily autonomy, choice, freedom, liberty. It's this idea that kids should have the freedom to choose and pursue whatever activities they're interested in. Now, obviously, there are going to be some restrictions uh, placed upon kids, but again, generally speaking, you know, we, we want to remove any of the gender, you know, restrictions that society may place upon how boys and girls ought to act. Now, there is a response to this, and some may argue that, I, I guess, that the main area of disagreement centers on how we view disparities in society. The gender-neutral approach tends to view them in a negative light. Um, that is, they tend to view the presence of gender disparities as implying that there's something wrong with society. Critics, however, may disagree with this. They may claim that it's important to consider why the disparities exist. If they stem from oppression or from some unfair set of circumstances, then perhaps we can object to them. But that may not always be the case. In other words, disparities don't always mean that there's some form of discrimination that's operating. Rather, an alternative explanation may be possible. So, for example, when it comes to how boys and girls play with toys, there may be natural biological differences which exist and which may play a role in producing these differences in play behavior. And, of course, you know, the implication of this is that when we see disparities in how boys and girls play, that this doesn't necessarily, you know, suggest that there's any type of a moral flaw in how society is functioning. While, again, disparities can be indicative of a problem in society, that doesn't need to be the case, and 
given the role that biological factors play in influencing the way that children play with toys, we don't necessarily need to, uh, you know, I guess, bring a, a charge against society and sort of condemn the way society treats children, again, just because there are disparities. We can be accepting of the fact that there are differences and perhaps even celebrate the differences between boys and girls. From this perspective, I guess you could, or at least you might be able to argue that gender neutrality isn't necessarily about equality per se. Uh, perhaps to some extent, it's about stamping out differences which may naturally arise between boys and girls. Um, now, I do want to kind of, you know, note uh, that th this sort of emphasis on society and one's environment and the, you know, sort of contrasting emphasis on biological factors that influence the way that children play with toys can exist on a continuum. So, you know, on, on extreme ends, you can have people who say that all the disparities are produced by biological factors. Um, on the other hand, you know, you have people who may say all of them are produced by, you know, social or environmental factors. Um, then you can have people sort of in the middle where, you know, maybe they both contribute equally. Some might think that the biological factors are the predominant forces, as others may think that environmental factors are the predominant forces. Um, you know, so it's, it's at least worth bearing in mind that, that perspectives on this matter can exist on a continuum. And again, that's sort of worthwhile to, to keep in mind. From what, I, from what I've gathered, that's generally speaking a, a nuance that's often discussed in the, in the scientific literature. You know, both seem to contribute, but it's not entirely clear how much each contributes to producing these disparities. So, based upon what's said, and based upon these disagreements, the role of science in this debate should be somewhat evident. Um, much of this focuses on the question, what causes gender differences to emerge when it comes to how children play with toys? And of course, those who adopt the more gender-neutral approach t tend to see them as, as, I guess you could say, the byproduct of social forces, whereas in contrast, those who oppose the gender-neutral approach, tend to view biological factors as perhaps not the only factor that, that influences child play, but as a significant factor that influences how, child, or how children play with toys. Now, this brings us to the current study. Um, you know, and, and a lot of the, the reason why this, this research on baboons is, is, I guess, somewhat significant is because research uh, on the... the you know, on, on how kids play with toys and what causes kids to play with the toys that they play with. You know, when you're doing this on humans, you bump up against a few challenges. Um, and that's because we live in a society where there are both biological differences between males and females, and there are social differences in how we treat people of different genders. And because of this, it makes it difficult to determine you know, how much each contributes to the gender differences if they contribute. I mean, think of it this way, you know, imagine you have, have high blood pressure. And so you decide to exercise and you decide to take a pill. After a while, your blood pressure goes down. You can ask, why did the blood pressure go down? And, and in a sense, it's hard to know the precise reason. Um, it could be the exercise. It could be the pill. Uh, perhaps it's both. And perhaps it could be some other factor. And so ideally, to be able to distinguish these alternative explanations, we'd want to conduct an experiment. And in this experiment, you'd have um, you know, a group of people who you know, took just the pill, another group of people who just exercised, a group that did both, a group that did neither. And then you could sort of compare the outcomes when it comes to the impact of these different interventions or the absence of an intervention on blood pressure. And unfortunately, this type of manipulation generally speaking, is impossible when it comes to how societies function and when it comes to how we raise kids. It's hard to compare a society, you know, with gender roles, with a society that doesn't have any gender roles, and then observe how the kids play. Um, you know, practically speaking, it's not possible. And of course, ethically speaking, you're going to run into some, some constraints as well. And so because of this, you know, there tends to be a degree of uncertainty when it comes to actually studying kids. And this is where animal studies come in. Presumably, the social forces that are operating in a human society aren't present in these, these uh, different species that we're studying. So, you know, I mean, when it comes to gender disparities in humans, you may say that, well, you know, kids are, 
watching TV shows where the boys and girls act differently, or perhaps, you know, they go into a toy store and they see a boy section and a girl section, or they watch advertisements and they see a boy playing with trucks and a girl playing with dolls. And this can influence the way that the child, you know, views, you know, how they ought to act, and it can sort of influence the way that they behave. And again, presumably, animals aren't going to be subject to these types of influences. And so this can make studying them, I guess, a, a useful way of, of sort of teasing out the biological versus the social causes of toy, or toy preferences or, or play behavior. And of course, the, the biological differences that we have observed, or at least that, that were observed in the BBC documentary in Baboons, at least seems to suggest that there may be I guess we could call it non-social forces at work when it comes to influencing what toys males and females play with. Um, it's also worth noting that this has been replicated in a handful of other studies. Um, I think one was back in 2002, another was, one was, was in uh, 2008. I'll, I'll kind of post some, some pictures of them. And what, what these studies found, again, I don't need to get into... Or I, it's not worthwhile to get into the details. The, the study designs were actually structured a little bit differently. But the point is, is still made that both of these studies, in addition to the baboon experiment, found that there were disparities between how males and females played with toys. And again, all of these studies, I believe, were done in non-human primates. So, uh, again, you know, in a sense, this is significant because it seems as if we've been able to design an experiment or at least be able to produce observations about the impact of non-social forces on, you know, toy preferences. And this at least seems to suggest that biological factors may play a role. Now, obviously, the limit of these, the, the, these types of studies is that these are done on, you know, other species, and you can't always be certain that the results are necessarily going to apply to humans. Perhaps they will, but again, because you're dealing with a different species, there's a little bit of doubt that at least should be present when it comes to applying these results in one species to an entirely different species. So then the question arises, you know, g given this debate, given that the science and some of the evidence and some of the uncertainty that surrounds the evidence, you know, where do we go from here? And this can be a bit challenging. I mean, again, part of this is because there is uncertainty in science, and I think that that's that's it's sort of important to acknowledge when it comes to, to, I guess, understanding the debate about how we ought to actually function in society. And this is because certain ideas tend to cluster together. Um, generally speaking, you'll find that morally accepting the disparities between boys and girls tends to occur in conjunction with the belief that biological factors play a role. So, you know, if, if you think that there is a significant influence of biological differences or biological sex differences on behavior, then you're more likely to be willing to accept that or accept the disparities between boys and girls. On the other hand, if you tend to think that the disparities are produced by social forces that are operating, then you tend to be more likely to morally condemn the disparities that we see in society. Now, there's an important implication of this connection, and it's that if there's uncertainty in the scientific understanding, then this may breed a degree of uncertainty in the moral realm as well. In other words, if we're not quite sure whether it's pr you know, primarily biological factors or primarily social factors that produce the disparities, then it may lead to some uncertainty with regards to how we ought to respond when these disparities exist. And this can raise the question, you know, how do we live amidst this uncertainty? You know, do we err on one side versus another? In other words, you know, perhaps... You know, on one hand, you could assume that differences exist, and then perhaps make adjustments if that turns out not to be the case. So, you know, if you have a boy, you could raise it in a traditionally masculine way. And if it turns out that, you know, gender differences tend not to exist, or if it turns out that, you know, he is, is you know, interested in, you know, what are typically viewed as more feminine, you know, toys, then, you know, you can let him go down that path. Um, you know, that's one approach. You know, on the other hand, you could perhaps assume that there really is no difference between boys and girls, and then perhaps make adjustments, you know, if they, if they emerge later on. So, you know, if you have a boy and you have a girl, you'll treat them exactly the same. And if they, you know, tend to go down more, uh, down a more traditional path, then you let that happen. Um, if it turns out that they really don't behave all that differently, then you can let that happen as well. 
But in both instances, you're sort of making assumptions about what the starting point is, and then sort of reacting later on based upon how the children respond to that way of, of being raised. Um, another question worth asking is how do we react if differences exist? You know, do we accept them and view them, you know, perhaps at least to some extent as normal? Or do we view them as, as sort of a problem? Um, do we assume that they're, you know, the byproduct of how society operates and try to correct them? Um, again, this is, in a sense, this isn't really a trivial issue because, you know, on one hand, uh, there's a sense in which we don't want to impose our views on kids and restrict their potential in an unnecessary way. And this can kind of go both ways. I mean, on one hand, we don't want to enforce gender stereotypes unnecessarily on kids. Yet, at the same time, we don't want to, I guess you could say, sort of stamp out natural inclinations that kids may have um, just because we believe in some type of, you know, gender-neutral ideology. So that's pretty much it for this video. Um, this is a, a pretty oversimplified discussion of both the scientific and moral dimensions, but hopefully at least gave you a sense of some relatively new observations when it comes to this matter. Um, you know, again, it is interesting to at least look at what some of the research says when it comes to how animals play, and it's interesting to consider the implications that that has for humans, and hopefully it's at least given you some context for the larger debate that surrounds, you know, how we ought to view disparities between kids when it comes to the choice, to the, the toys that they play with, and, you know, how, what that implies for how society ought to, ought to function. Um, again, I, there's one thing I do want to emphasize, it's that when we're talking about disparities, we're talking about groups on average. So if you say boys are more likely to play with these toys, girls are more likely to play this way, we're not talking about every single boy or every single girl. We're talking about averages in general, and there is going to be some variation. So again, this, this idea that you know we should rigidly sort of categorize boys and girls into different boxes is, I think, one that you know, is, is pr pretty clearly incorrect. And when we talk about gender differences, we shouldn't think of them in that way. So so I just want to make that clear. And uh, with that said, that's pretty much it for this video. Thanks for watching, and goodbye.